good evening everybody today is world heart day uh, 29th of september and every year we we celebrate the world heart day to increase awareness about heart and heart diseases and for the webinar today we have uh, a, a, a very excellent speaker uh, anjali bajaj uh, anjali is a senior research fellow at uh, csr igib who has extensively worked in the area of cardiac channelopathies and very specifically the genomics of cardiac channelopathies. Uh, so uh, before I take a lot of time, uh, let, me, uh, let me invite uh, Anjali to this uh, webinar. Uh, the floor is all yours. Thank you, sir, for the introduction. Uh, hello, good evening, everybody. Um, so, uh, so today is World Heart Day, and it's an excellent opportunity uh, to use this platform to talk more about cardiovascular diseases and uh, the public health burden that they uh, that they cause, so that we can make ourselves more aware and we can learn about it more. So, with this, I will go to my uh, title. So, the title of my talk today is Genomics of Heart Rhythm. So, I'm specifically working in the area of inherited uh, channelopathies. And today, I'll be sharing some insights about uh, like how uh, channelopathies occur and what we have done in terms of that uh, area. So, uh, to begin with, I'll start uh, with the uh, rhythm. So, uh, human beings are intrinsically evolved to have a sense of rhythm in their lives. Uh, for example, if we talk about singing or dancing, if we don't have a sense of rhythm, we cannot actually perform. So similarly, we have a different uh, kind of rhythms going in our bodies throughout the clock, that is 24 seven. That is the circadian rhythm that actually tells us the sense of day and night accordingly which, uh, which we perform all of our functions. And the other very important rhythm is the, is the heart rhythm or the cardiac rhythm. So as you all know, that our heart is the size of uh, is the size of a clenched fist, but probably it is the most important and the strongest muscle throughout our body. So it actually starts beating long before our birth, uh, only about twenty one to twenty eight days after uh, conception, and it keeps on beating throughout our lifetime. So on a, in an average lifespan of about seventy years, our heart beats approximately two and a half uh, billion times. So that's a lot and it does not even ask for a rest. So what makes it so important and uh, so rhythmic is it's its uh, electrical musculature. So its electrical musculature actually constitutes sinoatrial node, which is the pacemaker of the heart, uh, which actually fires the uh, electrical impulses that goes to the atrioventricular node uh, because of which the atria contracts. And then this impulse actually travels to the AV bundle or the atrioventricular bundle that is between the left and right ventricle, which causes depolarization of these ventricles. And then the impulse is carried forward by the Purkinje fibers that is a very important and specialized uh, tissue for fast conduction. So this is how a cardiac cycle actually uh, is completed. Now, uh, during each event of this cardiac cycle, uh, whether it is contraction of the atria or the contraction of the ventricle or the repolarization of the ventricle, that is the relaxation of the ventricle, each of these events can be actually um, uh, uh, can be shown by the graphical representation of the electrical activity, which is also known as ECG. So, for example, we get a P wave when the atria contracts. We get a QRS complex when the ventricle contracts. And we get a T wave that uh, when the ventricle repolarizes. And that's how you see a complete ECG. Now, uh, talking about the cellular basis of heart rhythm, in our heart, we have a multiple variety of cells, such as the pacemaker cells, the smooth muscle cells, the fibroblast, uh, endothelial cells, epicardial cells, and the cardiomyocytes. So if we talk about about the rhythmic contraction and relaxation of the cardiac uh, of the cardiac activity, then I, I think the cardiomyocytes will uh, have uh, will be the most important uh, kind of cells. Why is it so? 
It is because in our cardiac muscle cells, in the cardiomyocytes, on the membrane of cardiac muscle cells, we have three different kinds of ion channels, which are potassium channels, sodium channels, and the calcium channels. So all of these ion channels actually open and close in a very orchestrated manner. Due to opening and closing of these ion channels, uh, the ions move in and out of the cardiac muscle cells. So these this movement of ions lead to the characteristic membrane potential curve in the cardiac muscle cells that we keep seeing in the textbooks also. So these uh, this membrane potential curve then, then further can be translated into the ECG pattern. So this is by far uh, the cellular basis of cardiac rhythm. Now, we know about the basal cardiac rhythm. What happens if the heart loses its rhythm? Then we have a problem. And then this problem is known as a uh, arrhythmia. So arrhythmia is a problem with the rate or rhythm of the heartbeat. During an arrhythmia, the heart can beat too fast, too slow, or with an irregular rhythm. The simplest way to classify and to understand arrhythmias is on the basis of heart rate. So normally, our heart beats at a rate of 60 to 100 beats per minute. Now, when uh, when our rhythm, uh, when our heart rate goes beyond 100 beats per minute, then we call it as a tachycardia or the tachyarrhythmia. Now, when it is between 100 to 150, we have simple tachyarrhythmia. And then if it goes more far away from the normal value, we have paroxysmal tachyarrhythmia flutters and fibrillations. On the opposite side, if we if our heart rate go below, uh, below 60 beats per minute, then we call it as bradyarrhythmia or the bradycardia. We have mild, moderate to severe kinds of bradyarrhythmia. The interesting thing about all of these arrhythmia events is that each of these events can be very well picked up and distinguished by their characteristic ECG wave patterns. If you see uh, the normal heart rate ECG pattern and then see the tachyarrhythmias and the uh, bradyarrhythmias ECG wave patterns, you will be very well able to appreciate that in case of tachyarrhythmias, the ECG pattern is very uh, congested. They're very close to each other. The the waves are very close and in this case the waves are very far away from each other so this is what happens if there is a uh, if the heart loses its rhythm now phenotypically we have a spectrum of phenotypes uh, a person can be asymptomatic if the heart is arrhythmic or he can have chest palpitations racing or lowered heart rate or shortness of breath fatigue can accompany with it a person can be uh, can feel dizzy or have syncopal events so syncope is the very important word when it in, in the field of cardiac arrhythmias it means loss of consciousness and a person can also have excessive sweating with it and uh, many a times the symptoms overlap with the epileptic seizure symptoms so a, a person can uh, think that it is of it is of a neurological cause but it can be of a cardiological cause so this is a very important thing to uh, remember here that this is an overlapping symptom between the cardiac channelopathy disorders and the neurological disorders now out of all these symptoms the most uh, unfortunate uh, uh, symptom is the sudden cardiac death which can present itself as the first symptom uh, in many times so Sudden cardiac death, it happens, especially in case of uh, young individuals which are less than 35 years of old. And uh, sudden cardiac death is actually very prominent and very properly like reported in the literature in case of various athletes. For example, in case of Reggie Lewis, who was a very uh, famous basketball player who died on court at the age of 27 uh, years because of sudden cardiac death. So... In all, in uh, overall, the sudden cardiac deaths can explain 10 to 30 percent of sudden unexpected deaths in the young adults, which are less than uh, 35 years old, with a negative autopsy for structural heart disease. That means, if you rule out by autopsy that there was no other structural heart disease that can cause the sudden cardiac death, then uh, majorly uh, these cases can be explained solely by the uh, cardiac and channelopathy disorders or the inherited arrhythmia disorders. Now, to manage these kind of symptoms and uh, to actually avoid these unfortunate scenarios of sudden cardiac death, one need to understand the causes of arrhythmias. So causes of arrhythmias can be categorized uh, as the genetic causes, which are very important causes, but that are clearly that are, that are sometimes not very clear to the individual that they are carrying this genetic cause in their uh, in their uh, DNA. 
the causes can be behavioral uh, like it is like uh, for other cardiovascular diseases also where we know that drug abuse alcohol smoking uh, stress anxiety can increase your ris risk to become uh, an arrhythmic an arrhythmic patient and other health factors also play a very important role such as the structural heart defect in case of cardiomyopathy uh, which is the uh, muscular uh, which is the structural disorder of the heart in which the muscle gets dilated uh, and uh, or, or if there is a history of previous heart ailment for example coronary artery disease which is very common if there are these kind of uh, symptoms already present then also chances of arrhythmias increases other factors can be increased bp diabetes increased level of blood lipids and dysfunction uh, thyroid gland which can be both uh, hyper hyperthyroidism as well as hypothyroidism and there are also certain medications that actually increase your risk of uh, of carrying uh, of uh, showing the arrhythmia symptoms Lastly, there have been uh, many uh, reports which have associated the COVID infection with the arrhythmia, arrhythmia uh, disorders. So these uh, taking all these causes into account, uh, we know that these are the causes that are there. Uh, but for this uh, talk, we will be focusing more about uh, genetic causes of cardiac arrhythmias. When we talk about genetic causes, we have eight different kinds of uh, arrhythmias that are broadly classified by Heart Rhythm Society, European Heart Rhythm Association, and Asian Pacific Heart Rhythm Society. It is uh, Long QT syndrome, Brugada syndrome, catecholaminergic polymorphic ventricular tachycardia, short QT syndrome, early repolarization, uh, progressive cardiac conduction disease, unexplained cardiac arrest, which is also known as uh, idiopathic ventricular fibrillation, and sudden unexpected death syndrome. So all of these different types of inherited uh, cardio, uh, cardiac channelopathies uh, are associated with different uh, set of genes in the literature and their prevalence have also been documented uh, but not for all of them. So out of all of these disorders, long QT syndrome is the best uh, understood uh, uh, syndrome in case of genotype and phenotype correlations and therefore it is also the prototype for understanding cardiac, channel, uh, cardiac and channelopathies. So the first case of long QT syndrome was reported in the year 1957 in a Norwegian family by Dr. Jervel and Dr. Lange Nielsen and therefore the syndrome is also named uh, in the honor of these scientists, uh, Jervel and uh, Lange Nielsen syndrome. Uh, they reported four cases of deaf mutism with a peculiar heart disease in the children of the same family and the ECG recordings revealed that there, uh, there was prolonged QT intervals in all the four cases and that was described as fainting attacks resulting in their sudden death. So unfortunately all of the four kids uh, in the family died of uh, this syndrome. Now uh, so basically in this case long QT syndrome was described with uh, or accompanied with other uh, symptoms also such as deaf mutism the case of uh, the case report of only long qt syndrome was uh, reported very later on by an italian pediatrician romano in 1963 uh, in families that involved multiple generations and independently another pediatrician who was an irish pediatrician ward described the long QT syndrome without any accompanied uh, uh, symptoms such as deaf mutism in 1964. So together, uh, the syndrome is named on uh, in the honor of these uh, pediatricians, that is Romano Ward syndrome. So after, only after, uh, so basically these initial reports were only the clinical reports of the families in which the in which the doctors could uh, trace down the families and take or take uh, can uh, to. Uh, took all the uh, family history and clinical history but the major genes that uh, uh, association that came it came very later it came after three decades and where uh, a group uh, led by Keating and colleagues found uh, three major genes KCNQ1, KCNH2 and SCN5A that were actually uh, very uh, related to these disorders and were all, also explaining almost all of the symptoms in the affected members of the families. Now, just to understand that how a genetic variation can cause these disorders, let us try to understand by this figure. So minus here and under, uh, uh, minus here means the loss of function, plus here uh, means the gain of function. So uh, in, in case where, whether there is uh, a gain of function or loss of function in the uh, major ion channel gene that, that I just mentioned, KCNQ1, KCNH2 or SCN5A, these ion channels will be affected. So if these ion channel proteins will be affected, then the electrical membrane potential curve that we saw earlier will also shift towards the right side. As you can see, the red uh, 
uh, line here dotted line here so basically if the, if this will shift then the uh, uh, further the ecg pattern will also be shifted and therefore you see that the t here is prolonged so that's why it leads to the formation of uh, the long qts in the ecg and that's how the syndrome is named long qt syndrome okay so this is on on the basis of ecg so if it it is not treated then it can actually lead to the ventricular fibrillation and where you see a uh, multiple uh, irregular peaks on the ecg pattern and if it it left uh, it if it is left unattended or undiagnosed it can actually leads to sudden cardiac death also so, uh, genetics is one aspect. Overall, the diagnosis of QT uh, uh, syndrome or long QT syndrome can be done when we uh, when we know that what is a normal QT. So basically, the normal QT ranges from uh, six, uh, 360 milliseconds to 450 milliseconds. It is said to be prolonged when it is more than 440 millisecond in men or more than 460 millisecond in women. Uh, there is a Bezet formula which actually take into account the heart to heart variability because it varies a lot and then uh, 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 corrects it based on that number and that's why it gives QTC that is QT corrected by this formula. So if the QTC or the corrected QT interval is more than 500 millisecond then it is said to be associated with the risk of torse HT point is uh, or the ventricular fibrillation uh, figure that we saw that can produce loss of syncope even uh, that can produce loss of consciousness events and that can actually lead to sudden cardiac death so there is a set of criteria that was established by schwartz in 1993 that actually takes into account various uh, different features such as ecg findings clinical manifestations and family history and gives different scores to it so by this table one can understand that only ecg findings are not enough to say that whether a person is uh, uh, is a patient with a long qt syndrome one has to take into account various other factors also so ecg findings is one and then clinical manifestation includes syncope uh, which is loss of consciousness and uh, congenital deafness also family history carries weight so when when all of these points are added up and if it comes uh, as more than or equal to 3.5 points then a person is said to have a definitive lqts or lqts if the if the score is between 1.5 to 3 then the person is said to have a suspected lqts if the score is less than or equal to 1 then uh, the clinician diagnoses it as unlikely lqts so this is a, a criteria used by the clinicians to diagnose LQT, uh, LQT syndrome. After diagnosis, one need to focus on the management. So management includes the treatment. So treatment, uh, the first line of treatment is always antiarrhythmic drugs that includes beta blockers or sodium channel blockers that actually act on the ion channels and regulate the movement of ions so that you do not get the symptoms of uh, uh, syncope or uh, dizziness. Okay, so this is first line of treatment. The other treatments include implantable cardioverter defibrillator, which is a device that is uh, inserted in, in the patient's chest and that actually looks at the heart rhythm. If the heart rhythm is going too fast, then the defibrillator actually uh, slows down the rhythm. If it is going too slow, then it increases so that it matches up to the normal uh, heart rate. So uh, when talking about the management, genetic testing plays a very important role. First point is it prevents misdiagnosis. So as we already discussed that uh, many times the symptoms of uh, channelopathies can overlap with the epilepsy. So it is uh, reported that as many as 20 patients, 20% uh, 20 of patients with uh, fainting episodes and seizure episodes are misdiagnosed as neurological uh, neuro neuronal seizure disorder. So basically when you misdiagnose a patient that actually increases the risk of sudden cardiac death. So it is very important to classify the them correctly and genetic testing uh, has immense value in doing that. Uh, the second is prevent uh, delay in correct diagnosis. So usually a correct diagnosis can take up to uh, 7 to 12 years. So if genetic testing can is, is done in time, then it can actually uh, prevent that delay. 
uh next point is to prevent unfortunate outcomes like we have seen uh, it has a high mortality in young so estimated mortality is 30 to 50 percent before the age of 20 to 30 years so this uh, this number especially in is true in case of cpvt which is catecholaminergic uh, catecholam polymorphic ventricular tachycardia which is one of the types of ion channelopathies so uh if left untreated so basically you can you can estimate now that uh, using these numbers that it how much a huge socioeconomic burden can these diseases pose so that's why genetic testing comes a long way here to recognize them early to identify them early and take precautions and uh, can guide them towards the treatment regimens next is to screen family members in follow up so once you identify a variation or a genetic defect in a patient you can actually go and uh, screen the whole family especially the younger siblings who are, who can be also at the risk of developing that uh, disorder over time so it therefore uh, realizing the huge potential of genetic testing uh, is important and especially in case of uh, cardiac ion channelopathies where we know that we can actually treat them uh, we uh, what we did next is we did a literature based survey so basically we have already talked about three major genes on these genes we have uh, we have curated all of the variations that are there in the literature and plotted them on their uh, ion channel uh, diagrams so these are the proteins protein diagrams of all the three genes so if you see all the blue dots all the blue dots here are the variations that were reported in the western literature all the red dots here if you see are reported in the indian literature and all the yellow ones are the overlapping ones so if you can see there are very few red dots here and even fewer uh, yellow dots so what does it mean it means that there is a very uh, there is a gap in indian population specific studies that are there in context of inherited arrhythmias and also there, because there are very few yellow dots meaning there are very few overlapping variations uh, in Indian population with the western population so this actually increased the need for looking at uh, looking more at the Indian population specific variations so realizing this need uh, in, in terms of channelopathy disorders our group uh, our group previously undertook a uh, uh, indigen study in which the thousand uh, healthy self-declared healthy individuals of India were sequenced. So basically whole genome uh, sequencing analysis was done. Sequencing and analysis was done for over thousand uh, self-declared healthy Indian, Indian individuals. The basic aim was to create the pilot baseline genetic data for Indian population that was not ex uh, that was inexistent at that time and to enable clinicians and researchers in resolving allele frequencies of rare variants and genetic epidemiology of the disease because none of that data actually existed and also to develop india india centric cost effective affordable and accessible genetic test for public health application so once you identify the variation you can actually use them to deploy a uh, co cost effective and affordable genetic test that can be used at a population scale so from this study, we could identify that there were about 55 plus uh, million single nucleotide variations that were there in 1000 individual data. And out of these 55 million uh, variations, 18 million were uh, novel, meaning they were not reported in any other population. So that was our aim to uh, discover such kind of variations. So this data is accessible and available uh, in, the, uh, in this website. You can go and access this data. So uh, now having this data in hand, we actually jumped on the opportunity and we uh, uh, analyzed this data set for cardiac ion channelopathy associated genes. So we looked at 1029 uh, whole genome data set to uh, actually uh, uh, find out the pathogenic variations in the uh, cardiac and channelopathy genes and we could find that there were 13 pathogenic and likely pathogenic uh, variations in these uh, 1029 genomes so uh, remember these all are healthy individuals self-declared healthy individuals still we could find about 13 pathogenic and likely pathogenic variations so using these numbers we could estimate a genotypic prevalence of about 1.4 percent so we could we estimated a number of number between 0.9 to 1.8 percent so average it came out to be 1.4 percent so basically uh, this number indicates that this much percent of population is uh, is having the risk for sudden cardiac death or for developing a, a cardiac ion channelopathy disorder. So this number was very high uh, that came out of our study and we reported our study uh, recently in the Human Genomics Journal. So 
now uh, using this number uh, we could we could also since we could identify these 13 variations we use these uh, 13 variations uh, we first validated this data set whether this is true or by chance we are getting so parallelly if you see here the number 53 parallelly we are uh, uh, we are uh, doing a study on patient cohort also so we have 53 we had 53 patients data with us uh, sequencing data set so we validated these 13 variations in this data set and we could identify that at least three three uh, patients or the three variations were common in between both of these data sets. So this actually uh, underscores the clinical utility of our data that whatever we are getting is not just uh, due to random or something. We it is it uh, actually has some uh, potential clinical potential value. So uh, we used uh, since we had these thirteen variations in hand now, which are actually clinical validated. Also, we use these thirteen variations to uh, uh, to make a high throughput screening assay because we knew they were prevalent. That's why we could identify them. The assay was the assay is PCR based screening that is uh, still that we are still developing, and it can run at an affordable cost in comparison to the whole exome and whole genome sequencing assay. So it uh, so because of our study, we could uh, actually translate it uh, translate it to make an affordable assay, and because these diseases are treatable. Uh, uh we are still uh, we are happy to develop this and through our guardian consortium that is genomics for understanding rare uh, diseases india alliance network we actually get a lot of uh, channelopathy samples from the clinicians and so basically clinicians when they see symptoms of cardiac channelopathies that uh, we have just discussed these symptoms uh, uh, when they when the clinician sees uh, he uh, refers the samples to us and uh, we actually uh, do the whole genome or whole exome based analysis now in our case since we have developed the high throughput assay uh, we, we will first uh, uh, run that assay to check whether uh, the patient is carrying uh, the channelopathy disorder or not uh, the channelopathy associated variant or not and then after uh, running the assay uh, we analyze the data and after an analysis we uh, report back to the clinician saying that this is the variation that we found but because uh, we are a research based setting so many a times we do not uh, find a reported variation we are very uh, usually very interested in the novel variations so when our novel variation is there we uh, just cannot um, uh, delineate the pathogenicity then we take that ahead to do in vitro or in vivo assays and uh, after doing the assays uh, it, uh, depending on the result that we have in hand uh, accordingly we take the action and then we report back to clinician so this consortium represents over 250 uh, is consists of over 250 collaborators uh, with 40 uh, major clinical centers all across across India and it is uh, currently impacting 3000 plus families. You can read more about it uh, through the through this website here. And now uh, uh, throughout my talk, I have touched on uh, various things, but there is a very interesting puzzle that is still waiting so to be solved in the cardiac channelopathy area. The puzzle is like this. So uh, in case of our uh, uh, study in which we uh, analyzed whole genome sequencing data set of apparently healthy individuals, we could find few individuals. So this blue dot, the big blue dot here represents the genotype positive individuals. The pink dot here represents the phenotype positive individuals. So we could identify through our data set a lot of genotype positive individuals that were carrying those 13 variations, but we cannot guarantee that all of them will develop uh, 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 will eventually develop a channelopathy disorder. Why? Because there are um, there are multiple other factors that contribute to the phenotype. Genotype has a role to play, but it is not the sole thing, uh, sole uh, aspect of channelopathy disorder. So patient, uh, so one has to have the family history, the clinical manifestations, um, age also matter, and gender also matter. So there are many many uh, uh, other in environmental influences that matter. So taking all other things into account, the Phenotype, phenotypic positivity is very less. So this is a uh, this is one of the problem in channelopathy disorders that they have a very low penetrance. Uh, even even uh, even if you have a genotype in hand, you cannot say that the person will get a channelopathy disorder. On the other hand, uh, since we also actively work on patient cohort, uh, from the patient cohort we have this pink dot, meaning all of the all of them were the already. Uh, 
patients so we know that they are phenotype positive but still we could uh, we could explain only a uh, few of the cases so there are many other cases that still uh, we are waiting for the genetic diagnosis we know phenotypically they are uh, channelopathy disorder patient but genotype uh, genotypically diagnosis is still pending so that means there are a lot of novel factors or novel genetic players that are still there which uh, which we have not touched upon so this is the problem of missing heritability in the field so because of these two things which we could uh, see throughout throughout our work there are many interesting puzzles that are uh, waiting to be solved in the channelopathy area so uh, for the people who are very interested to uh, uh, to know more about these disorders can actually go back and read this book known as karamia which is uh, a story of a, a sudden loss and uh, slow recovery in a teenager so the story is about a girl named as kara which who is 14 year old and uh, the story is uh, uh, like highlights the strength courage uh, of uh, uh, handling a disease and recovering from it uh, so you can actually go and read more about it in the end, I would like to uh, acknowledge my uh, supervisors, uh, Dr. Sridhar Sivasubhu and Dr. Vinod Skarya, and all of my excellent lab members, uh, the vibrant uh, team that we have here at IGIB, uh, who actually help in doing in uh, carrying out our work, and IGIB for providing us the platform for pursuing our research, and ACSIR also to uh, pursue our research, CSIR for fellowship, and all the present and past members of SSP and BS lab members. Thank you for listening us so patiently. Thank you, Anjali, for the fantastic presentation and uh, within much within the time limit. Uh, we have a few questions mm -hmm. online and I hope you could take them. Um, yes, sir. So the question uh, one is heart muscle cells have a higher fraction of mitochondria, hence can they be more prone to mitochondrial genetic disorders? Yeah, so actually it is true. A lot of uh, uh, cardiac disorders uh, are not due to the genes that are there in the uh, in, uh, responsible for heart functioning or heart formation, but they are actually responsible for the mitochondrial health. It is actually true. There is a significant overlap between the mitochondrial disorders and the cardiac disorders. So we have one more question, which says uh, certain LNCRNAs like RARS2 and FBXL4 have been reported to contribute to cardiac myopathy. Are there diagnostic tests available currently for the genetic basis of cardiovascular diseases? So as far as I know, uh, there are uh, not many genetic tests available uh, when we talk about LNCRNAs. Uh, there are still a lot of panel-based tests are there, uh, which actually take the genes into account and then uh, we do the analysis. Yeah, so I think we have all the questions out there. Thank you very much for all the viewers for watching and joining us uh, for this webinar on World Heart Day. Thank you very much. Thank you.